So I think we all want to learn how to be more compassionate. And the practice of compassion within uh, Buddhism, early Buddhism into later Buddhism, has an interesting history. And today we're going to look at a little bit of that history coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in, in living a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled life, consider subscribing to the channel. So I think uh, most of us want to learn how to be more compassionate. I know that's the case with me, that I find that, that I'm less compassionate than I want to be, than I feel like I should be, that there's, there's more compassion I need, that I need to learn. And so we look to the, to the history uh, of, of compassion practice, of practices that, that increase compassion, or that were supposed to increase compassion in, in Buddhist history in particular. And what we find is kind of interesting. We find that there, there were a number of developments within that history that took it from one kind of practice into another kind of practice. And I think uh, both early and later practices are interesting on their own, but also it's interesting to, to note the differences and to note ways in which, uh, you know, maybe one is more suitable than the other, either for us or for other people um, or for the kind of uh, place we're in right now. And in particular, I'll be looking at a paper by um, the great uh, scholar, Buddhist scholar, Analyo. Uh, I'm going to have a couple of lectures here about, about this history. And this first one, we're going to be looking at a paper of his, I'll put the, a link down below, that looks at the history of the practice within uh, the early uh, texts in particular, and how that developed then later on, after we leave those early texts behind and get into sort of what we would consider medieval kind of Buddhism. So within the early texts, compa compassion practice, uh, like um, a loving kindness practice, metta practice that I discussed in an earlier uh, lecture, I'll put a link up to that one here just in case you're interested, uh, the practice of compassion was basically a practice of trying to develop or cultivate particular uh, emotional states. An emotional state which we might liken to uh, that of, of feeling kind towards people who were in distress, pe pe feeling kind towards people who were, were hurting, feeling kind towards people who had had misfortune, and, and wishing for them that they overcome whatever difficulties they've had, whatever misfortunes they've had, wishing these kinds of positive wishes for them. So basically, we're supposed to cultivate a particular um, emotional state, a state of mind. And then we're supposed to radiate it outwards. In other words, to, to imagine ourselves, to sort of uh, envision ourselves you know, radiating this kind of emotional, this positive emotional state outwards in uh, the very, what's called the six directions. So the four cardinal directions around us, plus above and below so as to make a sort of a sphere around us slowly bit by bit. The way he says uh, within the early text, it's described as, as like uh, somebody blowing a conch horn would, would blow that horn towards particular directions and so sort of uh, fill the world with the sound of that horn. And the idea is that we're supposed to imagine doing this in a way that this, uh, this emotional state goes outwards without boundary. So we don't imagine it being stopped by anything. We don't imagine any part of the world uh, being uh, left out of this uh, sort of radiative positive emotion. And for that reason, these are generally termed the, the boundless or the immeasurable states. They're boundless. They don't have boundaries. Uh, the emotions that we, that we uh, project outwards are, are boundless. And they're immeasurable in the sense that we don't measure them, we don't put them within a particular box, we don't say they're just for this part of the world or this part of reality, but they're for everything. And this, when we get down to it, this is basically the entirety of the practice within an early context. Uh, insofar as the, the Buddha or somebody, uh, one of the Buddha's retinue, was talking to uh, other monastics uh, about how to practice, this is what they would have said. And there was nothing else to it. This was the practice. Uh, and we're going to see that that practice changes. In particular, it changes from a kind of, uh, we might almost call abstract kind of uh, projection of emotion towards directions into something more concrete. And that begins, this kind of uh, trajectory begins uh, right away with the Abhidhamma or the, the air, the, the the part of Buddhist philosophy that happened just after uh, the Buddha's death or in the centuries following, where basically the Buddha's sayings and his discussions and all the stuff that was remembered of him 
was collated and and tried to be brought into a more tried to be brought into a form that was easier to digest. And in the Abhidhamma, it's said that you're supposed to radiate this kind of feeling as if you're radiating it towards somebody who's miserable, who is in a state of misery, who's in a state of of deprivation, who is in a state of pain. And so it's it's a kind of a it's not that you're supposed to have a particular person in mind or indeed people at all, but that, that it's as if you had somebody like that in mind. So it's this is a sort of a, a way for you to spur your mind towards the right emotional state if it's or if it's not already within you. But then in, in the later commentarial tradition, we find this uh, this specificity becoming becoming tighter and narrower. We're supposed to radiate compassion towards specific people. Uh, we're also supposed in, within, let's say, the Visuddhi Magga, which is a 5th century text, a very famous 5th century text by um, the compiler and philosopher Buddhaghosa uh, within the Pali tradition, uh, where he takes a uh, particular metta practice, uh, that is the practice of loving kindness, towards specific people, spe- specific people from our own life. Uh, we, we begin with somebody who is very close to us, who is a benefactor, for whom we have a lot of kind uh, opinions. And we start with them, and then we work towards people who are close friends, people who are more distant friends, and then people who are enemies. And a compassion practice could work the same way. Um, I, I don't actually have the text with me right now, but as I recall, he does the same kind of thing with compassion. Hey folks, uh, editing the video here, and it occurs to me that I, there's more to say about uh, what Buddha Gosa says in the Vasudhi Magan, so I wanted to get some of that across. Basically, the, what Buddhaghosa says is that if we want to ar- arouse compassion, we should start not with somebody who is dear to us and close to us, because of course we'll only have uh, kindness towards them, but rather uh, we, should, we should try to arouse compassion uh, using first somebody for whom uh, uh, ill has befallen in our lives. And then, once we've aroused compassion through them, then we move towards somebody who's dear to us, and then somebody who we don't know, and then somebody who's a problem. But if we don't have somebody that we know uh, for, uh, in our lives for whom, uh, with whom uh, ill has befallen, we should, we're supposed to, then, rather than uh, not using anybody, we should try to pick somebody who has done evil, somebody who's done wrong. Because such a person, on a traditional understanding, is going to have... Uh, ill befall them either later on in this life or in a future life uh, due to karmic consequences. Um, so if we pick somebody who who does evil, who does wrong in this life, then we try to arouse compassion for them based on what we perceive as their future. Uh, and then again, we, we then move towards somebody who is dear to us and so on. So again, uh, Buddha Gosa in the, in the Vasudhi Magga is using particular people to, to arouse this notion of compassion within us. Taking, we're going from what used to be a general practice, a practice of general radiation in a particular direction, to a, a, somebody, a, a practice with particular people in mind. And we find the same kind of development actually within a Mahayana tradition, which is uh, separate from the Pali tradition I've just been discussing. Um, it's, a tra- it's, a, it's a tradition within Sanskrit, within a northern Buddhist tradition. In um, Analia points out within the Abhidharma Koshabhasya, which is a, a, lo- a lengthy treatise uh, by Vasubandhu. And in that text, uh, Vasubandhu actually also does say that we're supposed to take this kind of, of kindness practice out to uh, people that we know. But, and then this is very, very interesting, what he says within this text is that that practice is for beginners. That's not the, the most uh, advanced practice. Uh, the beginner uh, may decide to use particular people from their own experience, from their own life, to do the practice uh, of compassion or loving kindness. And he says that they should do this if they have a kind of a mental defilement that won't allow them to do the radiative practice that we saw uh, earlier from the early texts. That is to say, the, the, the practice of, of boundless compassion is the proper practice. But the beginner, uh, the person with a mental defilement of some kind, who is unable to do that, who, who can't sort of uh, generate the right emotional state within them and radiate it outwards boundlessly, should then begin with somebody that they can radiate towards and sort of start from there. And sort of that will be the stepping stone that will allow them to eventually get to the more advanced practice. And I think this is particularly interesting because um, nowadays within uh, Western culture, within the United States, uh, and I believe within uh, much of uh, Western culture that studies this kind of 
uh, these kinds of practices, we tend to oftentimes just stick with the, the practice of, of, of taking particular people. But again, within these traditions, these medieval traditions actually of Buddhism, it was, that was seen as a sort of a new development, and it was seen as something that was uh, somewhat inferior, at least within uh, uh, th this uh, Mahayana treatise, this particularly famous and important Mahayana treatise. It's also very interesting to note, as, as Analyo does, that within none of these traditions is compassion really uh, supposed to be, or recommended to be, uh, directed towards yourself. In fact, in none of the traditions are any of these boundless states of, of, of compassion, of sympathetic joy, uh, of, of metta, that is to say loving kindness, and none of these are supposed to be directed at yourself until uh, the uh, medieval tradition within, within the Pali tradition, that is to say the, the, the Visuddhimagga, in that text then metta, the loving kindness, is directed at yourself first. But in, in none of the other texts, that not in the Mahayana texts that, that, he, that he looks at, such as uh, the Abhidhamma Koshabashya, or other texts like that, we don't see the uh, uh, compassion directed at yourself. It could be that it's an oversight. Um, it's possible also that the radiation of these kinds of, of positive mental states are supposed to just include you by, you know, as part of this kind of uh, amorphous radiation, although that's not described as such. But I think it's probably more correct to say that, um, which Analia does actually, that the self is left out simply because it, it becomes a, a, prob a problem with the notion of, of reifying the self, of, of, of starting to believe in an essential self. The, the practice is general, the practice is, is really not directed at individuals for a reason. It's not directed at individuals, at least in the early practice, because to do so would be to, uh, would be to kind of give fuel to this normal tendency we have of understanding the world in terms of individual people, of I and them, of me and mine and they and them. By not having the practice involve people at all, as, as simply uh, boundless radiations of a particular emotional state, we're sort of getting around that problem. That is to say that the person-oriented practices, that these kinds of practices of compassion directed at particular persons, at particular individuals, or are directed at ourself as an individual, is uh, within this kind of context seen as inferior because it sets up a, a stumbling block that we're going to have to overcome later on. Whereas if we understand compassion as simply a kind of radiation of joy, of a certain kind of joy, of a certain kind of positive uh, mental affect, then we're not, we're not so much uh, getting ourselves into that trap. So within this video, I hope to have given you several potential practices that you can use within your daily life to, to increase a compassion. This will also work, of course, for increasing loving kindness and other related kinds of positive states. But I also hope to have shown that uh, while there are different practices, they have their, their, each of them has its strengths and weaknesses. Now, the early practice has the strength of, of as I've just said, not not reifying the notion of self, you know, of leaving self out of it, so that we're no longer we're not getting ourselves into the trap of thinking of I and them and me and mine. On the other hand, the early practice of boundless radiation can be difficult to achieve. It's difficult for many of us. Uh, I certainly find it difficult on my own to actually sustain that kind of positive mental state uh, long enough to, to be able to do that kind of practice. Now. Uh, to be fair, I haven't really tried as much as I probably should have um, because I've tended to use the later practices, but that's something to consider is that it's just difficult or can be difficult for some of us. The later ones, the later practices, on the other hand, probably arose for the very reason I've just mentioned, which is the early practices are difficult for a lot of us. And so probably later teachers tried to come up with formulas that would be easier for their students, uh, their monastic students to, to, to do to understand and to, to actually manage. So then the positive uh, features of the later practices involving particular people, where we start with uh, somebody, let's say, who is in pain who we know well, somebody who's in pain that we don't know, um, and somebody who's in pain that we may think ill of. You know, I mean, that kind of practice is one that we might use. And we try to extend uh, compassion to each of them. We try to maintain that kind of compassion for each of them.
that would be easier for us to do because at least we have a concrete individual in mind, or ourselves for, uh, for that matter. So that's a relatively easier practice, but it does have the, the, the pitfall of reifying this notion of self and other. So, but I'd be interested in, in your uh, compassion practice, any of these practices that you do yourself, whether it be compassion or loving kindness or a related practice, how you do it. Do you see, um, do you use one or the other of these uh, practices I've just mentioned here or some other practice? Because uh, there certainly are other practices we could use. Um, and what do you think of them? Do they work for you? Do they not work for you? Put them, put your questions and comments down below. Uh, I hope this has been useful. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in delving further on some of these issues and getting to other uh, issues that are coming up nowadays uh, on the web or whatever, uh, check out my Patreon page. And uh, thanks so much for your comments and questions. And please uh, come back next time. We'll see you in the next uh, one of these videos. And until then, uh, be well.